Hey, welcome. Welcome to Lincoln University. Welcome to Beer Lincoln Innovation and welcome to the Excellent Series. Uh, my name is Vin Deconi and I will bless you, Kenneth. And I will do um, a little bit of housekeeping and then I will introduce the Vice Chancellor of Lincoln University to you and he will take it from there, introducing the speaker. Emergency exits. Um, we do not expect any fire drills or um, uh, exercises. And uh, 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 stand here. Katie is looking at me. Um, we don't uh, don't expect any drills. So if we hear the alarm, it is the real deal. At that moment in time, if that that exit is safe, we will exit through that uh, through that door, and we will gather uh, on in front of the grass of uh, Lincoln Agritech. Uh, I've seen enough Lincoln University staff in the room, so follow the one that runs the fastest. Um, if there is danger out there, there are emergency exits to our right, to, uh, to our right, to my right hand side, to your left as well. Uh, toilets are back um, uh, to that door, and then it's the third door on your right hand side. Um, you'll see this beautiful uh, and, uh, and, uh, diagram indicating that there are refreshments and for the ones that looked around there is nothing in here. That is correct. The refreshments will be served in, the, in our kitchen area and um, we will be serving alcoholic beverages. Um, if you consume those, please make sure that you drink responsibly because your whānau wants you home safe. So with any, without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to uh, the Vice Chancellor of Lincoln University, Professor Brown Edwards. Get one minute. Not going into your talk, really. Um, yeah, Tena Koto Plato and good evening and uh, welcome to Lincoln University's uh, excellent series. This seminar series aims to deliver research outputs based on activities from Lincoln University. The series celebrates the academic reputation of our professional professorial staff and promotes a public forum to a broader national and international community. In this series, we seek to actively participate in and shape public discussions and key issues affecting our nation and communities while highlighting the significant impact of our leading research in the land-based sectors. This evening, we will hear from Professor Wangling Ma. Welcome, Wangling, as he shares his research insights on promoting sustainable agri-food production to ensure food security. Wangling obtained his PhD in Agricultural Economics in July 2016 from the University of Kiel, Germany, and joined Link University as a postdoctoral researcher in November 2016. He was appointed lecturer in Applied Economics in 2018 and became a full professor earlier this year. Wangling's research expertise lies in agricultural and development economics. Through his research, he strives to unravel the strategies and solutions that enhance farm economic performance, augments people's subjective well-being and household wealth. Wang Ling has published over 140 papers in peer-reviewed international journeys, earning five and a half thousand citations. His outstanding work places him in the top 1.2% of economists globally and among the top 200 agricultural economic economists worldwide. He is also ranked as one of the top three economists in New Zealand on those metrics. Earlier this year, Wang Ling was awarded one of the three New Zealand-China uh, Tripartite Partnerships funds for his work on the biocircular economy. And this was presented as part of um, the Chinese, Chinese Premier's visit to New Zealand. Wang Ling's research has been cited in many policy articles uh, globally, and he holds multiple leadership roles in prestigious international journeys and has actively served as a guest editor on many years. Welcome, Wayne. I look forward to hearing from you tonight. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your nice introduction, uh, Grant. Yeah, okay, all right, good afternoon. You are very welcome to the presentation. Today is my great pleasure to present my research. Uh, 
on the topic promoting sustainable agri-food production um, practices, outcomes, and uh, the way forward. Okay, so this is the structure of today's presentation. And firstly, I will talk about the challenges facing in sustainable agri-food production. And then I will talk about the practices adopted by smallholder farmers. And thirdly, I will introduce some empirical findings. In the fourth part, I will uh, talk about climate smart agriculture based on the spatial issue I organized uh, recently. And the final part is the way forward. So, angry food production is uh, critical to global food security. It is projected that uh, global population will increase to 9.7 billion by 2050. And meanwhile, food production must increase by 70% in order to meet the food demand for the ever-growing population. And agri-food production is also the origin and the prerequisite for the whole agri-food systems. So the, food, the whole agri-food system includes the food production, processing, packaging, uh, storage, and transportation, retail, consumption, and loss and waste management. So food production will determine other parts of uh, agri-food systems. The United Nations Development Program reports that uh, due to food insecurity, about 821 million people worldwide are chronically undernourished and over 90 million children under five are still dangerously underweight. Therefore, promoting sustainable agri-food is a key to ensuring food security at national and uh, international levels. However, sustainable agri-food production is facing challenges globally. So uh, in today's presentation, I mainly uh, I will mainly talk about the, the challenges facing in sustainable food production from three aspects. The first aspect is uh, climate change induced uh, irrigation water shortage because we know water is uh, important for um, agricultural production. So the drastic climate change is driving us to a hotter and a more parched world, leaving crop cultivation struggling with the irrigation water scarcity. So commonly we know global warming is a typical example of the climate change. And uh, however, climate change is also reflected by other uh, aspects such as uh, frequent weather variability, extreme temperatures, and uh, frequent droughts. And uh, climate change has also endangered the water supply and uh, um, hydrological cycle for both non-agriculture and uh, agriculture sectors. And then climate change reduces agricultural productivity. This is a very direct influence of the climate change on agricultural production and uh, leads to greater instability in crop production, disrupting the global food supply and uh, resulting in food and uh, nutritional insecurity. So the agriculture sector is usually more vulnerable and responsive to water supply variability um, than other non-agriculture sectors because of its uh, over-reliance on water for cultivating crops and uh, feeding uh, livestock, for example, in some African countries because of droughts. Some uh, livestock fed by smallholder uh, farmers died, it will be a great loss to not only to smallholder farmers, but also to the country. And water is a unique community with no variable substitutions. And there's no doubt that the increasing climate change will amplify the adverse effects of a water shortage on global food security in the future. And here are some examples of the evidence uh, consequences of uh, um, water shortage. 
And uh, the scholars have found that uh, climate change induced uh, water shortage, uh, water scarcity can lead to uh, 30 percent uh, or more loss in crop yield. And the crop production loss induced by water scarcity and droughts has uh, reached a figure of uh, 30 billion US dollars in the past uh, decade. This is reported in the research by Gupta and co-authors. And water scarcity has become one of the most uh, pressing challenges to food security uh, worldwide. It is clearly um, no water or water shortage will directly affect agriculture production. Uh, the second challenge I wanted to discuss here is uh, soil quality degradation. So soil quality is vital for improving um, crop yields. The, for us, uh, the very direct impression is the uh, fertile soils are more productive. So however, land uh, exploitation, overuse of uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, pesticides and industrial pollution continue to degrade, uh, degrade soil quality. Especially in developing countries, farmers are heavily relying on chemical fertilizers and uh, pesticides to maintain or enhance agriculture productivity. So in agriculture economic discipline, we call agriculture uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, pesticides as um, uh, yield enhancing or productivity enhancing inputs. However, the um, uh, overuse of chemical fertilizers and pesticides will lead to uh, degraded, de degraded the uh, soil quality. And uh, globally, about 33% of the uh, soil is uh, moderately and highly uh, degraded. And in China, for example, around 28% of the land is affected by soil erosion and over 16% of the national soil was uh, deemed polluted. So the soil quality degradation will directly reduce the crop yields. The reduced crop yields will lead to food insecurity. Okay, so the third challenge I wanted to talk about today is the farmer labor shortage. So especially in developing countries, due to rural to urban migration, far agriculture sector is facing serious labor shortage issue. Because in developing countries, usually men are more likely to migrate to urban areas to look for better job opportunities while women and old people are left uh, at home to uh, operate farm work. So finally, it results in serious labor shortage issue. So labor shortage will result in rising costs of uh, labor because when uh, labor uh, supply is uh, lower than demand, the price of labor will increase the rising labor costs will further increase the production costs. Even in developed countries, labor shortage is also a concern. So for example, in New Zealand, in dairy sector, we are facing the labor shortage issue. That's why government is using the um, immigration policy to attract laborers from other countries such as uh, Philippines. So in New Zealand, uh, dairy sectors uh, hired a lot of uh, uh, foreign workers. To This is a, a way to uh, solve the labor shortage issue. So this is a, a figure from, from China. It shows the changes in total agriculture, labor force and the rural uh, migrant workers. So clearly from this figure, we can see uh, the number of uh, total agriculture uh, workers uh, is reducing over time, while the number of rural uh, migrant workers 
is uh, increasing. So finally, uh, it will result in labor shortage issues in farm sectors. Okay, so uh, I mean, uh, sustainable agriculture food uh, uh, production is challenged by many, many factors and due to time constraint. And in this presentation, I mainly focus on those uh, three aspects. And the farmers worldwide have adopted various technologies and practices to improve agri food production because for farmers, they always like higher yields because higher yields will determine higher gross revenue. Higher gross revenue will determine higher farm profit. And this includes, for example, soil and uh, water conservation practices, water saving irrigation systems, shifting crops on cropland, adopting drought tolerant varieties, and uh, even sub uh, substituting labor with uh, machinery to improve uh, production efficiency. So from the perspective of water, soil, and uh, mechanization investor perspective. This research estimates the effects of sustainable agri-food production practices on farm performance. So here, uh, as an example, uh, many focus on integrated water management technology, soil conservation practices, and mechanization for land preparation as examples of uh, sustainable agri-food production practices and uh, find out how adoption of uh, these sustainable agri-food uh, production practices affect farm output. Okay, so these uh, three uh, sustainable agri-food uh, production practices respond to three concerns. The first one is to mitigate water scarcity by improving irrigation water use efficiency and improve soil quality and substitute farm labor and mitigate labor shortage issues. So why is land preparation important? So land preparation is supposed to loom large over water scarcity in crop cultivation. And land, land preparation practices such as deep tillage and harrow significantly increase the air uh, permeability of the soil and accelerate the decomposition of a soil organic matter, which contribute to fertile soil development and uh, crop root proliferation. And meanwhile, uh, land preparation helps retain surface runoff by increasing soil uh, porosity, thereby leveraging irrigation efficiency. Therefore, appropriate land preparation could help increase the irrigation water productivity of crop production. And secondly, I would like to talk about uh, uh, mechanization. So mechanization-based production can compensate for seasonal labor shortages, uh, reduce drudgery, and allow rural households to perform uh, operations at the right time, and also allow rural households to expand the production areas to achieve economies of uh, scale. Uh, as I mentioned previously, in many countries, they are facing labor shortage issue. So agriculture mechanization can substitute um, farm laborers, which finally contribute to the improvement of uh, uh, farm production uh, performance. And given the significant advantages of uh, mechanized agriculture, governments and uh, stakeholders in several countries have actively promoted um, mechanization in both smallholder and commercial farming. So, for example, they gave uh, subsidies to the farmer uh, associations or farmer organizations. Uh, so the farmer organizations can buy farm machines at a lower price. So they can um, uh, they can um, provide the service to their members of the farmer organizations. 
And this is a, a figure about uh, agriculture mechanization in China. So clearly we can see the total power of agriculture mechanization uh, machinery and also proportion of a mechanized tillage area in total planting areas are growing over time. This is uh, uh, thanks to the effort of the government because in China, uh, the uh, the government uh, provide, uh, provided the farmers and also the uh, cooperatives with a lot of uh, subsidies in order to promote agriculture mechanization. So uh, in this research, as I mentioned, that uh, I will focus on integrated water management technology, soil conservation practice, and uh, mechanization for land preparation. So here, this is a uh, uh, Oops. Uh, this is a, a definition of the uh, technologies I used in my research. So for the integrated water management technology, it mainly refers to the application of uh, liquid fertilizers through a uh, irrigation system. This is a new technology in developing countries. So I mainly look at how uh, the adoption of integrated water management technology affects um, banana farms performance measured by banana yields, gross revenue, net returns, irrigation frequency and irrigation uh, expenditure. And uh, secondly, I will uh, estimate the effects of soil conservation practices on rice yields. So here, soil conservation practices are uh, captured by uh, farmers' adoption of a soil remedi uh, remediation, commercial organic fertilizer application, and also uh, formulated uh, fertilizer. The third one is uh, mechanization. It mainly refers to uh, whether household use the machines for uh, rice land preparation. So in this uh, research, in today's talk, I mainly focus on banana and uh, rice as uh, two examples of uh, uh, crops. Um, so we use the first-hand data and uh, second-hand data to support the, the research. So here, I would like to show you some figures about uh, um, banana production. Um, so banana, in some countries, banana is treated as a uh, uh, as fruits, but in other countries, it is treated as a main food. Okay, so here from this figure three, we can see these are top five banana producing countries. And uh, uh, India is uh, the largest banana producer. This is uh, followed by um, China and uh, Indonesia. So we can say, although globally, uh, China is ranked as the second largest producer of uh, banana. However, uh, the yield, yield means the uh, output per unit of uh, land. The output is, is the yield, the banana yield is only ranked as uh, uh, 25th uh, globally. That means, although the total banana production is uh, quite large globally, However, the per output per unit of uh, land still has a large area to grow because uh, improved crop yields. Uh, uh, even uh, I mean, for rice, uh, it is directly uh, we, uh, it is directly uh, uh, can be treated as a um, uh, food crop, but for banana, uh, it's an important cash crop. So high yield can uh, help farmers to make more money. More money can help farmers to ensure their food security. So they are really related. And um, the figure five shows the uh, rice production in top five countries. So here we can see China is leading the world in rice production. This is followed by uh, India, Indonesia, uh, Bangladesh and uh, Vietnam. 
So again, we can see that uh, in China, the rice yields is only ranked 11th uh, globally, which means there's a large area to, to be further improved. Okay, so uh, uh, next I will introduce how the adoption of uh, uh, those uh, sustainable angry food practices contribute to food security. So these are empirical models. I will not introduce the uh, details here. And uh, yeah, I will skip this <laughs> because uh, many few people in this classroom are working in the field of economics. So yeah, it might be very, very boring, but for economics, uh, they are very simple equations. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I just want to show you the results. Okay, so this is the uh, estimation for the uh, first objective, that is to uh, estimate the impact of integrated water management technology adoption on farm economic performance in plant production. So clearly we can see that uh, adoption of integrated water management technology uh, will increase plant yields by around 20%. Yeah, as I emphasized previously, higher yields will contribute to uh, higher food security. And it also increases gross revenue and uh, net returns as well. Interestingly, uh, here we can see that uh, adoption of the integrated water management technology will increase uh, irrigation frequency, but uh, it does not increase irrigation expenditure. So this is quite simple to understand. So for example, person A eats three times per day, per day, person B eats six times per day. We cannot see the person who eats six times per day has a, has a higher food expenditure compared with the person A who only eats three times per day. So here, we because uh, the integrated water management technology improves the irrigation efficiency. So finally, which does not actually increase the irrigation expenditure. Uh, so secondly, uh, the impact of soil conservation practices on rice yields. So from the results, uh, we can see that uh, for uh, for people who adopted the soil conservation practice, their rice yields are 7% higher than those who did not adopt the technology. So in conclusion, we can see the soil conservation practices can help increase rice yields, which eventually contribute to food security. The, the third one is the uh, uh, mechanization for land preparation. So here, the results show that adopting uh, mechanization for land preparation will increase rice yields by 0 0.214 kilograms per uh, cubic meters, because here irrigation water productivity is uh, measured uh, at uh, kg per cubic meters of water. So uh, I also uh, look at the differences of uh, di differences between household uh, uh, household owned machines and uh, outsourcing uh, machinery services uh, when I. Uh, estimate the impact of uh, mechanization for land preparation on irrigation water productivity. So in developing countries, usually farmers have uh, two ways to access farm machines. The first one is uh, household, uh, household owned machine. They buy the machine for household usage. The second one is to buy uh, outsourcing services they buy services and the service providers do the work on farmers' behalf. So here, 
uh, I can probably, uh, it is not direct for you to read the results, but uh, I can explain. So clearly here, um, the results show uh, no matter uh, the farm machines are household owned or outsourced, they can increase the irrigation water productivity. And there's no difference um, between these uh, two types of uh, machinery sources. In other words, so uh, using the machine for land preparation will increase irrigation water productivity, no matter which source farmers get the machines. Okay, so here I give a quick uh, summary. So when um, the integrated water management technology can increase uh, plant yields and it also increase the frequency of irrigation, but it does not increase irrigation uh, expenditure. And uh, adoption of soil conservation practices can improve rice yields by 7%. And uh, also the adopting uh, mechanization for land preparation will significantly increase irrigation water productivity. And all these three technologies will, will eventually contribute to, um, to the improvement of uh, uh, food security. And uh, in the fourth part of uh, today's presentation, I will talk about uh, climate uh, smart agriculture. So climate smart agriculture practices or technologies is also considered as a sustainable agri-food production uh, practice. So a transformation of the agriculture sector towards climate resilient practices can help tackle food security and climate change challenges successfully. So promoting the adoption of climate smart agriculture practices is crucial to improve smallholder farmers' capacity to climate change, mitigate its impact, and help achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, such as the no hunger, no poverty, or climate change action, and also responsible production and uh, consumption. So climate smart agriculture is an approach that uh, guides farmers' actions to transform agri-food systems towards building the agriculture sector's resilience to climate change based on three pillars. So what are three pillars? So the first one is uh, by implementing the climate smart agriculture practices, trip, trip win results can be achieved. The first one is uh, uh, increased uh, farm productivity. The second one is uh, enhanced uh, farm resilience. And the third one is reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So when we consider whether uh, technology, agriculture technology or um, practice is a climate smart agriculture practice or not, we should check whether the technology or uh, practice can help to achieve these uh, three objectives. That is the first one is increase crop yields or farm productivity. The second one is to enhance farm resilience. The third one is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So in agriculture economics, technology is different from technology uh, used in other uh, disciplines. So for example, fertilizer, pesticides, uh, improved uh, seeds, they are all technologies uh, for use for agriculture production. So uh, governments in different countries and uh, in international organizations such as NGO have uh, made great efforts to uh, promote the climate smart agriculture. So climate smart villages in India for example, and uh, civil uh, society organizations in Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America have been 
uh, developed to reduce information costs and uh, barriers to and bridge the gap in finance access to promote farmers' adoption of uh, sustainable agricultural practices, including sustainable uh, climate smart agriculture. So for smallholder farmers, they do not adopt a technology. Um, probably they cannot understand the technology. So the civil and climate smart villages or civil society organizations, they can improve farmers' understanding because when we adopt a new technology, we must understand the function or the feature first before we decide whether we should adopt it or not. Or even for some smallholder farmers, they have uh, no fund, no money to buy the suggested uh, and technologies. So for those uh, uh, organizations such as the Climate Smart Villages or civil society organizations, they can probably they can provide the farmers with a loan, enabling them to buy uh, sustainable agriculture practices. So besides agriculture training programs have also been used to enhance a farmer's knowledge of climate smart agriculture and their adoption of the technology in Ghana. Uh, usually, uh, the training programs are provided by agriculture, we call it agriculture extension agents, or sometimes uh, agriculture extension agents collaborate with uh, uh, farmer organizations because uh, it's very hard to, um, uh, to ask farmers to sit together to attend the, uh, the, the, the workshop or training programs. But for uh, agriculture cooperative uh, farmer organizations, such as cooperatives, they have members in their organization. They can easily uh, organize uh, seminars or workshops or, uh, provided by governments or farmer organizations collectively. So smallholder farmers worldwide have adopted various climate smart agriculture practices and uh, technologies to reach the objectives of uh, climate smart agriculture. These, these are just examples. For example, integrated crop systems, drop uh, or crop, uh, uh, this type of here is called crop diversification and inter uh, cropping. Crop diversification means farmers uh, grow different types of uh, crops to mitigate the risks and uh, uncertainties of agricultural production. And uh, intercropping improved uh, paste, water, and nu nutrient management, and uh, so on. So here, I want to emphasize that uh, there is uh, no consistent um, definition about uh, climate smart agriculture technology or practice. Farmers in different countries have adopted different technologies to achieve the goal. So previously in uh, literature, uh, many scholars considered uh, can consider one technology or one practice as a, a climate smart agriculture technology or uh, or practice and analyze their effects on farm performance. And uh, in recent years, many scholars have uh, considered the combination of uh, different uh, uh, technologies or practices, or we call it intensity. And in some African countries, such as Tanzania and Kenya, climate uh, smart feeding practices in the livestock sector have been suggested to tackle challenges in feed quality and uh, availability um, generated by climate change, aiming to improve uh, livestock productivity and uh, resilience. By using the, this slide, I just want to emphasize that uh, Climate smart agriculture practices or technologies are not only used for crop production, they are also used for livestock production. Farmers are just using some practices or technologies as a, as a component of climate smart agriculture to tackle the negative effects generated by climate change. Okay, so because uh, this is a very hot and important topic. Uh, my collaborator, 
uh, Dr. Dio Rahut uh, from Asian Development Bank Institute, Japan, and I collaborated on the uh, general spatial issue, climate smart agriculture, adoption impacts and implications for sustainable development to enhance our understanding in this uh, field. This uh, spatial issue has been published in Mitigation and Adaptation Strategies for Global Change, which is a uh, uh, Q1 ranked journal in Sigmago GCR ranking list. So through this spatial issue, we received 77 submissions from 22 countries. So we can see uh, the contributors are quite diversified. So climate smart agriculture practices are not one country or two country concern, it's a global concern. And uh, finally, we invited uh, 20 uh, authors to present at the conference uh, organized for the spatial issue. The, uh, the invited authors are from 10 countries. And meanwhile, after each presentation, we invited a professional discussant to comment on each presentation, uh, helping the presenters to get uh, professional feedback to further improve their research. So um, among those uh, uh, 77 uh, papers received, we only selected uh, 20. Uh, for organizing the conference, but uh, we sent uh, around um, uh, 44 papers for external review. And uh, finally, 19 papers were published in the spatial issue, so it is available online. I just want to share some key findings from the spatial issue. Um, so firstly, uh, in general, from the spatial issue, we can understand that uh, climate smart agriculture adoption contributes to improve the farm resilience to climate change and uh, mitigate uh, mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, climate uh, smart agriculture adoption leads to higher crop yields, increase the farm income and uh, greater economic uh, diversification. And uh, integrating um, climate smart agriculture technologies into traditional agriculture uh, practices not only boosts economic uh, um, variability, but also contributes to environmental sustainability and uh, health benefits. So uh, we have uh, more key, uh, more findings from the spatial issue. I just uh, list um, three of them that are highly relevant to the presentation today. Okay, so now I uh, come to my last uh, slide, the way forward. So enhancing sustainability in agri-food production is a process and uh, it should consider the context in each country. And promoting sustainable agri-food production should uh, uh, take into account the social, economic, and environmental dimensions of uh, sustainability. So usually in the literature, many scholars have uh, focused on the economic dimensions of uh, sustainability, and uh, very few studies have focused on social and uh, environmental dimensions of uh, sustainability. Therefore, the future studies can uh, work towards that direction. And in particular, future actions should uh, at least uh, improve uh, governance, which is essential for the sustainability of uh, both uh, natural and human systems, and further improve uh, efficiency in the use of uh, resources, because uh, for lots of re resources on the Earth, it is they are limited. And um, especially in agriculture production, we have two ways to increase crop yields. The first way is to increase the levels of uh, production inputs. The second way is to improve uh, production uh, efficiency. That is to improve the efficiency of the uh, production resources. For the first way, uh, increasing the farm yields, crop yields, by increasing the levels of uh, 
um, production inputs will increase production costs. However, by increasing crop yield through increasing the uh, the efficiency of uh, uh, resource uses will not uh, result in the increase in production costs. So this is a better practice and also enhance the resilience of people, communities and uh, ecosystems, especially to climate change and uh, market um, volatility. And finally, climate smart um, practices are usually country and uh, crop specific. Therefore, more efforts are needed to explore the climate smart agriculture practices that uh, can potentially increase crop yields and uh, improve uh, food security. Um, because for the agriculture practices and technologies, they are very country specific or crop specific. In different countries, we have uh, different uh, climate zones. The climate conditions are very different and uh, different countries are growing different uh, crops. That's why uh, for the development programs, they should uh, target to develop crop specific and the country specific practices or technologies in order to improve uh, crop yields, which finally contribute to food security at national and uh, international levels. Thank you very much. That is all my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Wang Lei. Um, an opportunity now for some questions. Oh, yes, right. please. If you would just state your name at the start. So. Uh, I ask Adid, I'm uh, doing my PhD here. Yeah. Very interesting one. It uh, really pops a lot of questions around, but uh, I totally want. Um, you mentioned uh, mechanization, a big tool to, uh, to mitigate food security, food insecurity. That mechanization can help to have more production, enrich the farmer, and uh, help to mitigate food insecurity. But at the same time, increase in mechanization would be a challenge to climate, uh, you know, um, the climate change or the uh, global warming at the same time. So I think uh, it's a point to be explained. And also in your second graph, you mentioned. Uh, the mechanization percentage in China that was going up, but I noticed that it was dropping. Was there a reason of, of a dropping while China is progressing in mechanization and technology? And obviously it should not drop, but uh, the graph shows up. Uh, you mean the, the, the graph uh, showing the yeah, uh, yeah. this one? This one. Yeah, this one. Oh yeah. Oh, you mean for the first one? I mean, it is slightly, it is slightly uh, decrease, but uh, it is still higher than many previous years. And uh, after 2021, for that figure is uh, not available. Yeah. Okay. So let me answer your questions. Uh, for uh, let me answer your first question. Yeah, you raised a very good point. So agriculture mechanization plays an increasingly important role in agriculture production because agriculture mechanizations can substitute uh, farm laborers, which will reduce the labor shortage issues. And uh, I mentioned that uh, for many farmers in developing countries, especially for men, they migrate to urban areas to look uh, to look for better job opportunities. So mechanization can empower rural women uh, and help increase the production. And also uh, mechanization can increase the uh, production efficiency. So for example, traditionally we are using the, uh, the hand manual machine to spray pesticides. If we use a mechanized one, Definitely, the efficiency will be improved, and also, and also it's good for uh, human health because uh, when we improve the uh, pesticide spring efficiency, farmers are uh, less likely to be exposed to pesticides. Yeah, in recent years, that is another concern. Uh, mechanization may also 
uh, may also contribute to climate change because the mechanization will release the gas as well. So, uh, I mean, there is always a debate, but uh, currently for most of the studies uh, globally, they focus on how agriculture mechanization can substitute farm labor, uh, influence uh, into household labor allocation, and improve uh, farm efficiency. Yeah, I think that area will be uh, uh, will, will be next agenda uh, in the literature to look at how mechanization uh, also uh, contributes to climate change. So this question is please. An opportunity for another person. Yes, please. Yeah, Murray Doak from MPI. On your last slide, you had a seems about governance. Yeah. How are you seeing governance changing with some of these changes? Oh, yeah. Okay, so clearly uh, in many countries, government can decide how the resources in that country can be allocated. And the government can decide what kind of uh, technologies and uh, uh, practices should be promoted or distributed among uh, producers. Therefore, good governance, it is uh, very important to promote sustainable uh, agri-food production as well. Yeah. Thanks. I have a question, um, Wang Ling. You mentioned, uh, I think, three sort of technologies. You had mechanization, had things to do with water uh, in particular, as, as examples on um, yield of banana and rice. What about education? Education. As, as a mechanism to actually really drive um, <laughs> our productivity in addition to these things. Where, where does it stand? No scale yeah. impact, because so, you talk about technology. Oh, yes. Okay. So for education, uh, in economics models, education, uh, if we do not focus on education, education is usually controlled as a control variable. So in today's slides, I did not show the, the, the uh, uh, education variable. You see here, we have uh, uh, control variables. So education is here. Farmers' age, education, genders, and other variables, farm size, host size are included in the control variables. So in the journal article, we include them. So usually, education can contribute um, the adoption of innovative technologies. Usually, uh, we can find that education has a positive and a significant impact on um, technology, innovative technology adoption because uh, better knowledge can improve uh, farmers' understanding of the benefits, costs, or risks associated with uh, new technologies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Take it back and then let's find here. One of the scary things about governments is that sometimes governments become dog for dead. And also in New Zealand, we are we're constantly thankful that countries like Argentina seems to have a problem with their governments. If we don't mind, we'd be stuck. <laughs> so Governments would seem to be a very important component of agricultural and economics. Yeah, uh, that's true. Um, but uh, in um, so uh, in economics, we have uh, uh, three levels analysis. Usually, the first one is a cross-sectional data analysis. The second one is a panel data. Oh no, we have a microeconomics and a macro. For micro uh, microeconomics, we are focusing on smallholder farmers. It's very hard to control the governance uh, variable in the analysis. But uh, so for my, for my research, it mainly focuses on microeconomics. But for people who uh, study macroeconomics, that is a national level, 
so they can find ways to include the governance. Governance is usually included as a control variables to see how governance can influence some uh, expected outcomes. Yeah, and also in different countries, the government power is a little bit uh, different. <laughs> uh, like in China, uh, since 2015, the government uh, implemented the, the action. Uh, it's called uh, zero growth of uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, pesticides. They trying to reduce the pollutions generated by chemical fertilizers and uh, uh, pesticides. But at, at least from the uh, statistical yearbook, we can see the, uh, the usage or the consumption of fertilizers and uh, pesticides did not increase, but we have no idea whether it, it really increases or not. Because from a, from, from a statistical yearbook, we can say government has the absolute power to control the label of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. <laughs> so in reality, we have no idea whether it is controlled or not. I just have two more questions from here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, can you pick on there, Lincoln? Um, it's a small measurement question. We can probably talk about it later. But um, it was unclear to me how the soil conservation practices you identified and, and measured actually contribute to the conservation of soil. But uh, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Oh, yes. And um, so, in, this, uh, in that paper, the uh, soil conservation measure is uh, captured by those uh, three practices. The first one is uh, soil remediation. The second one is uh, uh, organic fertilizer, commercial organic, organic soil uh, application. The third one is a formulated uh, fertilization. So if uh, farmers who adopted those uh, three practices so we consider the farmer as a adopter of soil conservation practices. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I understood that. I was. It was just the link between activity and soil conservation. That's the mm -hmm. topic for discussion. Yep. <laughs> oh. You have to see. So, are you able to make a comment on where New Zealand stands, particularly considering our government seems to react non-react to agriculture? Uh, yeah, this is a hard question because I, I think the, uh, the Department of Agriculture in New Zealand has uh, less power to control farmers' behaviors. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the farmers here, they run their own business. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the long run, and definitely it, it is worthwhile to find out what kind of uh, uh, climate smart agriculture practices should uh, be adopted in at least in dairy sector. Because in one slide uh, I presented uh, in, uh, in which country? In, uh, in that country, uh, oh yes, uh, such as in Tanzania and Kenya, they adopted, uh, they ad adopted the climate smart feeding practices as the climate smart agriculture practices in the livestock feeding. So here, because uh, uh, New Zealand is focusing on dairy um, production, and it is one of the top eight, I think, dairy producing countries in the world. So definitely it is worthwhile to investigate what are the best practices of climate smart agriculture that be that can be adopted in the dairy uh, sector to mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions and uh, increase dairy productivity. I have done some research previously with Katie and uh, my other colleague uh, Alan Rivik. We found that uh, in this country, uh, farmers imported a lot of supplementary feed from other countries to increase the uh, dairy productivity. However, the important supplementary feed increases the production costs, which actually did not increase farm productivity or farm profitability 
uh, at all. So imported feed increases the dairy productivity. However, it also increases the production cost, which did not actually increase farm profitability. That's why we need to do more research, in, especially in the dairy sector in New Zealand, to find a way to find a way how can we progress the sector in the towards the more sustainable way. So does government subsidy like in Tanzania? Does government subsidy by uh, an encouraging adoption of CSA? Um, in these countries and. Um, they also, in addition to government efforts, they also have the help from the international organizations such as NGO to help farmers because they are. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is a, the, in one slide. I also mentioned the country specific. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Some of this that probably pulls into the gamut going from digital agriculture to smart agriculture to precision farming, agriculture 4.0, climate smart agriculture, which are all terms to describe very similar aspects of the agri-food system we have out there at this point in time, using advancements and technologies, of which New Zealand is using many of those at this point in time, one of the productions that's already, perhaps just under a different name, but climate smart agriculture you in this point in time. Anyway, Thank you for your, your questions today and your contribution, uh, um, uh, Wang Wen. Um, it's a great pleasure that we just got a little gift here uh, for you to um, congratulate you. We welcome you out into the whole year for um, to be a success. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah,